Arise, my soul, arise. All right. Arise, my soul, arise. Shake off thy guilty fears. The bleeding sacrifice in my behalf appears. Before the throne, my surety stands. Before the So it was supposed to be. There's always something. <laughs> All right, give me a thumbs up when you have both of those things rolling. What's that? YouTube's going. Okay. All right. I'm glad for the people that are able to tune in through the live stream. What? It's fine. Just hit the go live. Is it live? Yeah, I know, it does that. I ended it, but it, sometimes it does that. I'll have to fix it when I get home. So did you hit the live on both of those? All right, let me take a look at it. Let me see here. Okay, so I guess, oh, I see on Facebook. Okay, all right. And could you click on the little black um, thing and make sure that the sound is moving? Since Mark's not here, I have, uh, have to handle most of this myself, so that's why we have this take a little bit longer. Does it look like the, it's picking up the sound and everything? Okay, all right. I think we're good to go. Uh, should be good to go. <laughs> we'll just go. All right, so turn to Genesis chapter <clears throat> 9. Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. And uh, for the sake of, you know, 
for the record, you know, with the online audience, obviously it's a wonderful thing that we have the technology. There's some people that for health reasons or distance reasons or for whatever reason um, can't make it to church. Uh, but I would, as a, as a Christian and as a Bible believer, I, I, I want to point out just a, a, something to keep in mind. Um, obviously, if there's nothing a person can do about it, that's fine. Online is fine. But there is coming a day, I have no doubt, that uh, these online Bible uh, sermons and preaching and teaching is not going to be available on social media for much longer. It's not going to be able. It's not going to be able to be streamed on YouTube, and it's not to be, going to be able to be streamed on Facebook, uh, because on YouTube and Facebook, as it stands, everything is closed captioned. So that's wonderful for people that are, uh, you know, hearing impaired. Uh, but the problem is that closed captioning is also put in a database. And it wouldn't take very much for a few certain words to be run through a, a search engine, you know, and for YouTube and Google to basically be able to censor anything that uses certain key words, which show up in sermons all the time. You can't preach on the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah because you'll get flagged on YouTube or have your stuff pulled off, off the web. So that day is undoubtedly coming. Right now the uh, persecution is against conservatives, but as soon as that uh, moves, the very next step after the persecution of conservatives is going to be the persecution of Christians, undoubtedly. And we're going to be the ones having our speech suppressed, and we're going to be the ones that are going to start being banned off of online platforms, just like the conservatives are right now. So just to I just want to throw that out there as a forewarning. Um, I encourage Christians to get used to being a part of a local church. Get used to coming to church because this opportunity uh, to do the online stuff uh, is not going to be around forever. And, um, you know, when all that is taken away, it's a good thing to already be in the habit of coming to church, being around Christians, you know, because I don't think we're going to have these liberties for very long. Um, but again, that's not to say that anybody who doesn't come to church is a lesser Christian, or if you can't make it and you stay home. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that Mark Peden is a lesser Christian for staying home today because he's sick. <laughs> but uh, sometimes that's just the way it goes. All right, so we'll keep uh, using this opportunity as long as we have the ability to. But, uh, you know, just kind of be thinking ahead because things are crazy right now in our country, and you don't know what's going to happen. So be in the book and be close to the Lord. All right, Genesis chapter 9, verse <clears throat> 18. It says, And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. And these are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. Okay, you have a very clear statement right there. This is after the flood of Noah, and uh, the, the whole world has been wiped out. You know, the Bible is the only scientific textbook in existence that tells us where the Earth's populations came from and, <clears throat> and where the people groups began. And as I, point, and I, was, as I was saying, there was a massive global population that began with Adam, but all of those uh, likely billions of people from the time of Adam to the time of the flood, you have to understand, is roughly 23 hundred years. And so if you look at all the statistics of uh, populations, you know, and, and even today they talk about there's a threat of overpopulation and the population curve is just going skyrocketing right now because there's so many people, people more, the more people you have, the more kids you have and the faster it expands. Well, if you were to take those same numbers, if you were to consider the lifespans of people prior to the flood, ex uh, examine the length of time from Adam to the flood, it is very, very easy to see that the global population prior to the flood was likely in the billions, probably upward around 10 billion or more. And that's just with the very l most basic uh, counting methods. That's even being very conservative with the numbers. There could, ease, there could possibly have been 20 billion, 30 billion, 40 billion people on the earth that perished at the time of the flood. But when the flood happened and Noah and his family got in the ark and came through to the other side and survived, all you had was eight people once again on the earth. You had Noah and his wife, Japheth and his wife, Shem and his wife, and Ham and his wife. None of them had any kids at that time. Which is interesting, because they were all around 500 years old at that time. So, uh, but it's, it's peculiar. But you only have them, those eight people on the ark. And they're the ones that are going to repopulate the earth. And then in Genesis chapter 10, the Lord gives the genealogies of these three boys. And Genesis chapter 10 tells the general direction that their offspring went. And if you were to read through there, you find, uh, you know, in Genesis chapter 10, you have these ancient names 
of uh, people who named cities after themselves and these ancient cities and countries. And these names that you find, you read about in Genesis chapter 10, the, a lot of these are validated by archaeology and by various artifacts that have been found in the king, list of kings. You read about some of these guys. So it's just more proof that the Bible is true, unlike the Book of Mormon. You know, the cities mentioned in the Bible can actually be found and oftentimes discovered through archaeology, whereas the Book of Mormon, you know, the cities and the places that they mention, you know, that are supposed to be over here in North America, when the ne tribe of Nephi or whoever came over here, none of those things have been validated by any archaeology. In other words, it's just total fabrication garbage. So in very general terms, from the location of the Tower of Babel, and I meant to draw a... Uh, uh, the earth. I guess I could draw Europe real quick. It's not that hard. So you got Africa and you got, uh, you know, the Caspian Sea over here and you have uh, Mesopotamia and the rivers and the Persian Gulf over here. Okay. So, and this is the Mediterranean Sea and you have Africa over here and you have the Nile. Okay. And you have the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. All right. So you got the world right here. You have uh, Ararat is going to be up here, but uh, you find that after Ararat, you know, when the ark parked, uh, the nations of the world go down to where this Tower of Babel is, and they're trying to build this tower, you know, down in the land of Babel. And from there, God divided the languages, and the whole earth was overspread. And in general terms, what we read about in Genesis chapter 10 is the Shemites went eastward uh, into Asia and China. And uh, then you have the uh, peoples traveling along the line of the river, obviously, they're not going to travel across this Arabian desert and they die. So the people travel, the Hamites, they travel north and then they go southward toward Africa. And that's why you have them all through up Canaan, all the way up to Hamath up here. Ham goes over here to the west primarily. And then uh, Japheth, he goes into the north, northwest. Okay. Japheth goes up here. All right, and he goes and he settles into uh, the European countries, the Russian countries, and Greece and things like that. All right, so the Bible gives us three main groups from which everyone in the world today came from, and you can't go ten chapters in your Bible before you come to the clear and obvious conclusion that there are differences in the people groups or the races, if you will. Now, don't worry, this is going to be a real racist lesson or anything like that. But there are some things that you need to understand about this stuff. It's important that you understand, as a Bible-believing Christian, that God separated the races and He set the bounds of the various people groups. And the purpose of that, according to Acts chapter 17, was that they might seek the Lord. If they might feel after Him, the Bible says. The reason why God separated the people, because as they get together, the more wicked they become and the less they seek God and the greater they think they themselves are. So God separates them. So that those people will seek after God. And God's will is that people remain separate and not get all mingled and intermingled together. Now, living in America, you know, we are hopelessly intermingled, so there's not a lot of point to worry about it too much, okay? But uh, man's will is to get everyone together and pretend that we're all the same. And uh, by nature, by nature now, we're not the same. Now, in Christ, all Christians are equal. Okay? Race, gender, class have no bearing on our relationship with God. That is to say that a man does not have a better relationship with God than a woman does. Okay? And that's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful thing that we have in Christ. We're all equal in Christ. Okay? But outside of Christ, and this is where the modern Christians are all screwed up, outside of Christ, humanly speaking, we are not all the same. Outside of Christ, humanly speaking, we're not all the same. It doesn't matter if that is politically or socially correct or not. That is the truth. And just like uh, there's difference in uh, gender, right? Outside of Christ, there, there's differences in the genders. You'd have to be crazy to think that the genders are the same, okay? I'm not talking about one being better than the other. I'm just saying that they're different, okay? There's differences, and that's okay. Um, today, racism is perceived as seeing differences in people, and you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to see differences. Uh, you cannot acknowledge differences. You have to pretend that we're all exactly the same. And today, sexism is defined as seeing differences in male and female. And now, all of a sudden, you're not even allowed to do that. You know, William Barr makes the very controversial statement and says that uh, the sexes, we, we base things in our society based on biology. 
and there's male and female biology. Oh, how could he say such a thing? <laughs> controversy. <laughs> what controversy? When has this ever been controversy? You're not even allowed to say there's differences between male and female. You have to pretend that we're all exactly the same. Well, according to that definition, okay, according to the world's modern definition now, God is a racist. God is a sexist. Okay? And, hey, Jesus is a sexist. And Jesus is a racist, according to the world's definition. I heard just yesterday that even the Merriam-Webster's dictionary is redefining the word racism. Isn't that crazy? Uh, according to the world's modern definition, I guess I'm a sexist. And I'm a racist. If, we're, if it just means seeing differences. Okay? And according to the modern definition, hey, guess what? You're a racist too. <laughs> and you're a sexist. Congratulations. Yeah. Now, <laughs> in, yeah. Now, amen. In, in reality and truth, uh, you are, you're, you're not a sexist. You're not a racist, more than likely. You are just simply someone who doesn't deny reality. In reality, a racist is someone who despises another person simply based on their skin color. And that's wrong. In reality, a sexist is someone who despises someone else simply because of their gender. And I'm not talking about transgender and cisgender and all these other gender. I'm talking about male and female. There's no reason to hate someone just because they're a woman. And there's no reason to hate someone just because they have a different skin color. That's ridiculous. When it comes to other people, we are to judge right and just judgment, right? Okay? So ruling against someone just because they're a different skin color is being, according to the Bible, a respecter of persons. And that is wicked, and God hates that. Uh, your opinion and judgment should be based on a person's character and right and wrong. Okay? I don't care what color your skin is. If you do right, I'm for you. And if you do wrong, I'm against you. And it's either right or wrong. It's based on character. All right? And uh, modern creation scientists these days are trying to deny the truth of Genesis chapter 10 and are always trying to draw your attention to Genesis chapter 2 and says, we are all of Adam. Uh, Ken Ham, just, I saw an email just the other day. I get the creation science emails. And he's got a real popular book. It's called One Race, One Blood. And the Creation Science Institute, they've got a lot of great stuff, but... They're always trying to draw your attention back to Genesis chapter 2 and Adam and say there is no such thing as the races. We're all one race and we're all one blood because we come from Adam. Well, that's not exactly true. The Bible says that God started everything over with Noah and his three sons. Okay? And his three sons overspread the earth. That's where, the, that's where things began as far as the modern age, if you will, is concerned. Not Adam. Yes, we are all one blood. We are. That's no problem. But we are not all one race. What that should say, the name of his book should be One Species, One Blood. That's true. We're all the part of the human species. But to say that we're all the same race just because we come from Adam is, is unbiblical. And that's uh, what Ken Ham and Creation and uh, Answers in Genesis are trying to do. It's funny, they, they call their organization Answers in Genesis, and yet they're undermining the book of Genesis at every turn. Why would you give your organization a name on a book that you don't even believe? <laughs> you know? So anyway, uh, uh, Genesis 10, uh, God credits the overspreading of the earth to three boys, not one man. And uh, Acts 26, or 17, 26 indeed says that we are all, all one blood. That's true. We're all of the human, ra uh, human species, but we're not one race. And races are different, and that's okay. Our cultures are different, right? Mm -hmm. Our speech is different. Our accents are different. Our ambitions are different. Our music is different. Boy, you want to know something that's really racist, you should listen to different musics around the world. They're not the same. <laughs> They're very different. Uh, our worship is different. People, there's people in other countries in India, they worship a certain way. I'm, not, I'm talking about Indian Christians, born-again Christians. They have a certain way of worship that we would probably be uncomfortable with. But, that's just, but they're doing it in, in spirit and in truth, and that's just part of their culture, and that's fine. Uh, same with Greece. They, their, music, their worship is different. Our values are often different, the things that, we're, that are important to us. You think about those Shemitic cultures. Man, if they dishonor them, themselves or their family or their country, that's like the worst thing they could ever do. They'd rather, what, what's that name of where the samurais kill themselves, you know, to... Harry, Harry what is it? Harry Carey. Harry Carey? Yeah. You don't find that here in America, in the JPEG, or in the Mexico, or in South America. 
that's that's a cultural thing. That's a shemetic thing. All right. So they're so our people. So we're different. Our appearances are different. Our foods are different. Is ethnic food racist? I love the different ethnic foods, right? Uh, do, we have different food flavors. You know what? Uh, it doesn't take a PhD to recognize that Italian food is different than Mexican food. Praise the Lord. I'm glad it's not all the same. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm pretty sure that Mediterranean food is different than Southern cooking. Yeah, amen. amen? <laughs> it's different. And it's okay. And that's good. But in the world that we're living in today, they're saying, no, you have to mash it all together. You know what you get when you mash a bunch of food together? <laughs> you get a gray, mushy blob, and nobody likes it. <laughs> so you can't deny reality. The people that are getting swept up into the current nonsense that you just can't help but notice around us all around us is uh, that's, you know, this nonsense that being, that's being promoted by George Soros, the BLM movement, Antifa, the Democratic Party. They're choosing, what are they doing? They're choosing to believe a lie. Yes. They're choosing to, they see something right in front of them that's so blatantly obvious and they choose to not believe it. They choose to not believe it. They're believing a lie. They're giving it, they're giving their volition up. They're saying, I know that this is wrong, but I choose to believe it anyway. And that's very dangerous when people do that. When you close your eyes to truth, you become blind. Okay? The truth is right in front of them. It's obvious. You know, you know why FBI crime statistics and facts don't matter to these people? You know, everybody thinks, man, if we could just show them the facts, we'll get on Fox News and we'll read documents, we'll show them the percentages, the statistics. Why doesn't anybody care? Right. Why don't they care? You'd think that some rational thinking person would think, oh, that's interesting. You know, that's interesting that African Americans compose 13% of the U.S. population but commit 50% of the crimes. Oh, that's very interesting. We should stop and think about that. Right. Why is that? But they don't care. You know, having a police force, you know, keeps a society safe and not in danger. Oh, that's statistically provable and historically provable. We should think about these facts. Maybe we should reanalyze our position of defunding the police department. Maybe we should think that. Why don't they care about facts? You know why they don't care about facts? Because if a person will deny the most basic truths of gender and race, they can easily deny any other truth. <laughs> if they won't accept the most basic biological facts about themselves, what other fact are you going to give them that's going to get through to them? You know what the Bible says? They have a reprobate mind. They've checked out a reality for a long time ago. You know what reprobate means? Reprobate means it's something that's cast off. It's forsaken. You say, did God cast them off? You could argue that, but uh, hey, one of the things you'd, I'd point out is these people have cast off their own minds. They've made their own minds reprobate. They've thrown their brain out the window and they choose not to think. So they're like animals. Uh, their minds have cast off and rejected the truth, but truth is still truth whether you believe it or not. Okay? So they think they've thrown out the truth, but in reality they've thrown out their own minds. It'd be like if uh, you're standing on a cliff, on the edge of a cliff, and there's a big building here. You know, and you shove that building, and then you see that building just flying away from you, and you're like, <laughs> I am so strong, I am so tough, I just threw that building. When in reality, it's all a matter of your perception. <laughs> you're actually falling off the cliff, and you're about to be destroyed, and that building has not moved. You're out of your mind. You actually think that you've done something. That's how these people are. They're trying to deny truth and overturn reality. You can't. You end up just destroying yourself because you're too stupid to recognize that uh, you're wrong. Now, if you refuse to acknowledge the basic truth of Scripture, that God made the races different, not intrinsically better than one another, one better than the other, not saying that, they're different, you will not understand a lot of the New Testament. Jesus' Jesus is insistence on preaching to the Jews and not the Gentiles is not going to make any sense to you. That's going to seem like a very racist thing to do. Uh, the truth of unity in Christ is going to be irrelevant because you already think we're all united anyway. And what Paul has to say in 1 Corinthians 1 will be completely meaningless. Turn there to 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1. Now this church, you know, you know, it... It's coming to a day where people are going to be nervous about certain things you say in church. Well, should you say that? You know, because it might get out to the wrong people, and then somebody might come here. Blah blah blah. The day we can't tell the truth in church is the day we might as well just shut this place down. <laughs> the name of this church is Truth Bible Baptist Church, so I'm going to put out the truth. And if they shut me down, they can shut me down, whatever. But uh, I'm not going to be afraid to tell the truth here. Okay. Now I realize out in the world you might have to use a little bit of. Uh, 
discernment, a little bit of prudence, you know, with what you say out in society, you know. I thought about putting a bumper sticker on my truck that uh, said all lives matter, because they do. Uh, but, uh, you know, my wife is nervous that somebody's going to get our license plate and come and burn our house down and Antifa's going to shoot us all in our sleep. So it is very possible. So she was right <laughs> and I didn't do that. Okay, so she had a good point. It's one of those things. Where, oh, you just want to say something, you know, and just go against the spirit of the age. But uh, you got to be, you have to have a little bit of just smarts, you know. You can say certain things without uh, endangering your wife and kids. All right, so that's important. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, <laughs> verse 17. When it comes to church, though, I'm putting out the truth. That's just the way it goes. I have to. That's my job. 1 Corinthians 1, 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made uh, foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now look at this. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Now, Paul, you know, the bigoted racist that he was, just stereotyped two groups of people. He said that the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. All right, so you kind of get the general idea of where these people groups went here. So we're going to have, uh, well, let's see. Let's write it like this. We'll get into all this here in a minute. Shem. Japheth, boy, this marker is terrible, and Ham. Okay, the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Shem is going to be connected to the Jews. Japheth is uh, connected to the Greeks. Okay, that's why the Jews to this day, if you persecute a Jew, it's called your anti-Semitic. You know, that's just one more confirmation of the Bible. Where'd that Sem come from? Well, it came from Shem. Who is the father of Eber? Who is the father of the Hebrews? That's biblical. That Shem, the son of Noah, on the, on, the, on the ark with all the animals. That never happened. Except we call it Shemetic, right? Yeah. It just goes to show you the Bible's true. All right, now, he said that the Jews require a sign, okay? And the Greeks seek after wisdom. All right? Now, the thing about stereotypes is that they are generally true, and that's why ethnic jokes are so funny, <laughs> because you laugh because you know it's true. And uh, the stereotype is here is biblical and was given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean that every Greek that's ever lived seeks after wisdom, and it doesn't mean that every single Jew that's ever lived and ever will live seeks after a sign. Those are uh, true, generally speaking, in cultures. You know, there might be some Jews that go after wisdom and some Greeks that want signs, but generally speaking, as far as culture is concerned, uh, that's what they're after. Now, if also, if it gets too hot in here, feel free to open that door because I know it can kind of get stuffy in here. But um, the Greeks are a people group that uh, are in that northwesterly area that went in that direction, and they're descendants of Japheth. And their big thing is wisdom, intellect, education, information, knowledge, science. You know, the love of wisdom is called philosophy, from the Greek words phileo, means love, and sophi, sophia, meaning uh, knowledge and wisdom. Philosophy literally means the love of knowledge, the love of wisdom. And hence, the world's most prolific philosophers come from Greece, Japheth, you know, the one who loves wisdom. You have Aristotle, Socrates, and Plato. Uh, even in Acts 17.21, it says, For all the Athenians and strangers, Athens is in Greece, uh, which were there, spent their time in nothing else, what are they interested? But either to tell or hear some new thing. That's all the Greeks are interested in, is they want to hear something new. Tell me something new. I want to learn something. The Japhetic, the Japhetic Gentiles naturally lean towards intellectualism and want to hear as much information as they can. And so, consequently, most of us Americans are Japhetic, you know, and we're interested in info, information, Google, you know, all that stuff. The Internet. Now, consider this. The uh, Jews, they require a sign. 
the Jews are interested in signs and miracles. And they're interested in this uh, because their nation began with Moses and miracles. Uh, prior to the Exodus, you had the families of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they became a nation in the book of Exodus, and that nation began when they came out of Egypt. That was essentially like a birthing of the nation. They come out of Egypt through the waters, right? Birth and water. And Moses is there, and what's he doing? He's doing these miracles. He's sticking his hand in, and he's got his leprous hand, and he turns his stick into a snake, and all these water into blood, and all this stuff going on. They're miracles. That's how the nation began, so they look for that stuff. The Jews, and even the Shemites, to some extent, naturally, are after signs, and they want to see things. So Japheth wants to hear something. Uh, Shem wants to see something. Okay? So we have uh, Greeks and Jews. We have Japheth and Shem. We have uh, wisdom and signs. And essentially, we have uh, hearing and seeing. Okay? That's what these people groups are after, the races, if you will. <clears throat> and... Uh, so, since that's what those people groups seek after, what do you think God is going to give them? Now, this is interesting. God's going to give them the exact opposite. That's really interesting. Think about that. Look at verse 23. So, the Jews require a sign, verse 22, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. So, we're going to preach wisdom to the Greeks and give the Jews a sign. No. He says, you know what we're going to do? We're going to preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews, a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, foolishness. <laughs> Just the exact opposite. What you're going to see in this passage is that man goes this way, and so God goes this way. You know why? Because God said, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways aren't your ways. God is the diametrically opposed to man's direction, uh, sinful man's direction. Japheth seeks wisdom. So naturally, God is not going to be found down the road of wisdom. Japheth gets in rockets and shoots out satellites to the edge of space looking for information, knowledge, wisdom. Japheth sends submarines down to the bottom of the ocean looking for information, knowledge, and wisdom. But does Japheth's efforts bring him any closer to God? No. Does Japheth ever find God this way? No. But what if he did? What if Japheth found God that way? You know what Japheth would say? Japheth would say, well, you know, we found God, and if you want to find Him, you are going to have to get an education and multiple college degrees, and after years of study, you too might find God like we did. <laughs> and uh, you, this would put Japheth in quite the position of arrogance, wouldn't it? You know? God, is, God isn't going to be found at the end of Japheth's intellectual rainbow. God's not going to do that. God says, okay, Japheth, if you want to find me, you're going to have to become foolish. You will have to reject your intellectual reasonings and come to Calvary. You're going to have to look upon God Almighty hanging naked, beaten, bloody, and being made a mockery of and looking like an idiot in front of the world if you want to find me. And you are going to have to accept Him. And you are going to have to call upon Him. And your salvation is going to be found in identification with Him. You know what it takes for Japheth to accept Christ? It takes humility and faith. Faith, just the word itself, is repugnant to an intellectual agnostic. <laughs> but that's what, <clears throat> that's what God chose as the path for Japheth to find him. By the way, keep in mind, keep that in mind when it comes to Christian apologetics. I just want to mention this, but there's nothing wrong at all with having answers to be able to answer everybody's questions and arguments to various uh, questions. But always remember that when it comes to Japheth and the Americans around us, you know, we're all intellectual. When it comes to uh, uh, re uh, salvation for Japheth, salvation is not an intellectual hurdle that can be overcome by reasoning. The problem is not with Japheth's brain. It's not that Japheth just needs to be a little bit more informed and then he'll get saved. It's not that. The problem is with Japheth's heart. You don't win Japheth to Christ by overcoming his brain and overpowering his brain and him saying, Oh, I guess you are, you're so much smarter than I am, so therefore I believe in Christ. No. <laughs> it's a heart problem. He doesn't want to yield to the idea of faith. Japheth says, Prove it and then I'll believe. And God says, Hey, Japheth, you're a liar. <laughs> All the proof you need is right in front of you. It's been there the whole time. The way it is going to go is like this. Believe it, and then I'll prove it. 
Oh, and Japheth hates that. <laughs> Japheth doesn't want to believe anything until you prove it to him first. Yeah, he wants control. He wants his prideful arrogance. And God says, sorry. You're just going to have to look like a fool and believe. Believe without the proof. <laughs> you know, basically, verse 24, he says, But unto them which are called, another word for saved, if you will, both Jews and Greeks, okay, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Isn't that interesting? Notice that you have Jews and Greeks again in verse 24, except instead of, uh, what I want you to look at that, verse 24, But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Jews, Greeks, Christ the miracle of God, well, it says power of God, and the wisdom of God. Those Greeks look after wisdom. Those Shemites, the Jews, they seek after signs, but the Bible replaced the word sign and miracle with the word power. Now, there's a reason for that. There's a connection between those things. That involves power being able to do signs and wonders and miracles. Uh, you remember that Simon the sorcerer, when Peter came through and people received the Holy Ghost, he said, give me also this power that whomsoever I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Ghost. There's a power there to those signs and miracles. Why, why does it say Christ the power of God? Or, um, or Christ the power of God? Christ the power of God. And then it says wisdom of God. Why does it have Christ in there and not on the Lord? Yeah, well, let's see. Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ is both the power of God and the wisdom of God. It just didn't repeat the word Christ on that second one. But I'll get into that part here toward the end. Uh, <clears throat> so, let's see. Uh, no, you're fine. Totally fine. The Jews are aware that there is a force, okay, that is unseen and it's more powerful than nature and it can manipulate the nature of the world around them. The Jews totally recognize that as a people. I mean, think about it. The Jews ate bread from heaven. The Jews saw water gush out of a rock. Uh, the Jews saw a sea split apart. And then they saw the Jordan River stop. And they went on dry ground. They've seen some amazing things. Man, if you saw that, you would be naturally inclined to that sort of thing. I want to see that again. <laughs> That's why when the Jesus was feeding the multitudes with the, f the five fish and seven fish, or, or five bread, seven fish, whatever, they were like, uh, you know, uh, can you do that for us again? You know, you know, Moses one time gave people bread in the desert, you know, but what are you sign? What sign are you going to show us? <laughs> well, how about some more bread? How about some more? How about another miracle? You know, the Pharisees were always after a miracle. And Jesus said, an adulterous and, and uh, sinful generation seeketh after a sign. You're not going to get a sign, you Pharisees, except for the sign of the prophet Jonas. What happened to Jonas? He was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. He died and he came back to life when he got barfed up on the dry land. And uh, that's the sign that the Pharisees got. That was the only sign Jesus gave those Pharisees was the sign of the three days and three nights in the heart of the earth and Jesus' resurrection. You want to know something about those Pharisees? They knew Jesus rose from the dead. Why? Because those Romans came and told them. And what did they tell the Romans to do? They said, shut your mouth. We'll give you some money. We're going to come up with this conspiracy. Tell them that the disciples came and stole them away. The disciples came and stole them away. We're a Roman battalion. How are these fishermen going to come and stay? Just people don't care about the facts. Just lie to them. They'll believe it. Don't worry. They won't ask questions. Fake news. Fake news. <laughs> Fake news. And guess what? The Jews, the Pharisees, were the ones behind that. They knew Jesus rose from the dead, and they didn't care. They didn't care. They knew he was the Son of God. They didn't care. And then when Stephen comes and starts preaching to him and says, You killed the holy and the just one, it says they were cut to the heart because they knew they were, he knew they was, he was right. And he was about to expose them and blow the lid off of that thing. And so they said, we better kill this guy. And they stone him and uh, th knock his brains out with rocks. You know, it's kind of like the, the modern uh, Democratic Party type liberal movements today, BLM. You know, it's, again, facts don't matter. You know, it's just brute force. You know, we don't want the deep, kind of like the deep state. It was a deep state back in the days of Christ. Uh, that was causing all that. So anyway, uh, quite the conspiracy. <laughs> but uh, if, you, if you saw that, you would want to see those miracles again. You would want to figure out, how could I have Moses' power? That's awesome. You know, and, uh, and you would want to figure out power and authority over the elements. And many Jews sought this power apart from God and ended up dabbling with idolatry and witchcraft. And later on, these dark arts and mystic practices uh, came to be known as the Kabbalah. And it's not just the Jews that are into that stuff. Shem naturally is into it too. 
And the Jews, uh, because they're from Shem, gravitate towards it, okay? So it's not just a Jewish thing, per se, looking for a sign, although that is primarily the case. But even Shem is after that miraculous, spiritual, supernatural power. Consider the religions of Shem. Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, Hinduism, Shintoism. These are all very spiritualistic religions that have to do with meditation, mysticism, astral projection, ascended masters, ancestral worship, right? Shem's religion are, are very much beyond the veil type of religions, okay? Shem wants to attain that spiritual power. Japheth is after the, the wisdom. Shem is after the power, that spiritual power to be able to manipulate the elements. And uh, Shem is not so much interested with information as he is mystical power. Shem thinks he is going to find God this way through these mystic practices. Now, what if Shem did find God that way? You know what Shem would say? Shem would say, well, you know, we found God. And if you want to find him, you are going to have to become a monk and meditate. And perhaps after many years of meditation, you'll be able to achieve enlightenment and become one with the divine, like we did. That would put Shem, now Shem found God that way through these mystic practices, that would put him in quite the position of arrogance, wouldn't it? Absolutely. God isn't going to be found at the end of Shem's mystical rainbow after years of meditation and then, da, you found God. That's not how it works. God says, okay, Shem, if you want to find me, you're going to have to become weak. That's what you're going to have to become. You'll have to reject your spiritual religiosity and come to Calvary. And uh, you're going to have to look upon God Almighty hanging powerless upon a cross and not using any miracle to do anything for himself. And you're going to have to accept him. And you're going to have to call upon him. And your salvation, Shem, is going to be found in identification with that weak man on a cross. And Shem hates that. You know what it takes for Shem to accept Christ? Humility and faith. Humility and faith. The Jews, Shem, requires a sign. So sometimes our natural reasoning as Christians is, well, if we could just do miracles and signs, they would believe, because that's what they want. But the answer is, no, they won't. No, they wouldn't. The Jews require a sign, that's fine, because God gave them permission to require a sign. But here's the thing. Christ came with more signs than any prophet in their entire history, and they still didn't believe. <laughs> it didn't do any good. So in other words, don't think that if you just give the people what they want, they will believe. The solution to winning Shem is not powerful signs and miracles. And the solution to winning Japheth is not intellectually superior arguments. Shem wants to see signs and miracles, but the eye is never content with seeing. Japheth wants to hear information and knowledge, but the ear is never content with hearing. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart, as they say. If you want to win Shem, appeal to the heart, not the eyes. If you want to win Japheth, appeal to the heart, not the head, not the ears. Now, there's one person in this chapter that's missing, or seems to be missing. There's one more people group that, where do we find him in this chapter? You might be wondering, well, what about Ham? You know, what about Ham? Where is Ham in this chapter? Skip down to verse 29 real quick. It says that no flesh should glory in his presence. The context here is, is, God, is God saying, hey, no flesh is going to glory in my presence. Now, we've dealt with Shem's flesh, and we've dealt with the flesh of Japheth, but if he says no flesh, then that has to include Ham, right? God doesn't want any flesh glorying in his presence. God, do, God won't allow the Jew, the Shemite, to glory in his presence. God won't allow the Greek, Japheth, to glory in his presence. But what about Ham? Does Ham get to glory in God's presence? Does God take a knee on Juneteenth to Ham? Does God take responsibility and apologize to Ham for having his God privilege? <laughs> ho, ho, ho. Uh, no flesh is going to glory in God's presence, including Ham. But that implies, then, that Ham should be in the chapter somewhere. So that's interesting. We read about the Jew, Shem. We read about the Greek, Japheth. Uh, but where is Ham? Well, don't worry. God didn't forget Ham. 
And by the way, God didn't refrain from saying something about Ham because he was worried that maybe if he did, you know, Ham would get mad and spray paint BLM on his golden streets and burn down his mansions. God's not afraid of Ham. He's not worried about him. Look at verse 24. God includes Ham. He's here. Verse 24. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God, Shem, and the wisdom of God, Japheth. Because the foolishness of God, Japheth, is wiser than men, and the weakness of God, Shem, is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men, Japheth, after the flesh, not many mighty, Shem, not many, what's the next one? Noble. noble. There's a third group there. There's a third thing there. He doesn't end it with the wisdom and the mightiness, the power. There's another group there. Not many noble are called. So who's that third group hinting at? Wisdom pertains to Japheth. Mighty and power pertains to Shem. And so noble, nobility, has something to do with Ham. Look at verse 27. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. That's Japheth. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. That's Shem. Now ready for it? Look at verse 28. And base things of the world. Now in case you're not sure what base means, it's going to be clarified in the next statement. And things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. That's the third group. That tells you something about what Ham is interested in and what Ham is after. We've found out what Shem is interested in, what Japheth is interested in. Ham is hidden in the chapter, but he's there. And it's implied. You know what Ham's problem is? You say, oh, well, Ham doesn't have any problems. And if you think Ham has a problem, you're a racist. <laughs> no, Ham has a problem. All right, just like Shem and Japheth does. Ham seeks after something. And this thing that Ham seeks after causes him to get farther and farther away from God the more he pursues it. Just as Japheth's lust for wisdom takes him farther from God, and just as Shem's lust for magic and super, with a K and supernatural power takes him farther from God, so Ham has something that he seeks for naturally, generally speaking as a race, and it takes him farther from God. You know what Ham wants? Well, before I tell you, go back and take a look at something that stained Ham's descendants a long time ago. Genesis chapter 9. This will tell you what Ham is after. What Ham wants. Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 24. Now, I'm trying to be cognizant of the time. We started a few minutes late, so we're still good. Don't worry. Genesis 9, 24. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. Now, there's some time that has elapsed from Noah and his family getting off the ark until what we're reading right here. It doesn't say how long, but there is a time elapse. And, in verse, and it says that uh, Noah, basically, he had planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine of the vineyard. He probably was expecting everything would be fine, because he's probably done it a hundred times before the flood. But now that the environment is broken and messed up after the flood, these th the wine is fermenting far faster than it ever has before. He gets uh, completely drunk, you know, off his feet. And it says that Ham, his youngest son, did something to him. Okay? Uh, the Bible doesn't specifically say, say what Ham did. But whatever it was, it was bad enough that Noah cursed Ham's child, his offspring, his seed for it. Look at verse 25. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, that was Ham's uh, son, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. Now, the fact that Ham's seed was cursed implies that Ham's sin, whatever Ham did to Noah, has something to do with seed. Okay? And there is a reason why Sodom and Gomorrah were Hamite cities. Okay, I'll let you put the dots together. Okay, Connect the dots. Verse 26, and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his, Japheth's servant. You say, why is he cursing Canaan? Why not just curse Ham? Well, it's because Japheth and Shem were blessed... And Ham was too. 
Ham was blessed by God there in uh, verse 1 of chapter 9. It says, And God blessed Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah can't curse Ham if God's already blessed him. So what does Noah do? He curses Ham's son. It's in, Ham ends up having four kids. Canaan's only the firstborn. So it's implied that these other three boys aren't born yet. Otherwise, you'd think Noah would have cursed Canaan, Misraim, Cush, and the other one, Phut. <laughs> but the other ones weren't born, so he just curses Canaan. He's a lot. He's a little, probably a little baby at that time. He says, you know what? Your boy is going to be the servant to the Shemites and the servant to the Japhethites and their offspring. Now, it is debatable, you know, as to whether the curse extended to Ham's three other sons, okay? Some might say, well, it was only the Canaanites that were cursed that were going to be the servant of servants. Maybe, maybe. Um, but it is interesting that uh, Ham's genealogy since the flood has been connected with a servant of servants. I tend to think that that curse extended to all of Ham's children. But we could debate it. You know what Ham hates, though? You know what Ham wants to rid himself of? Turn back to... Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He wants to rid himself of something that's been in his race since his very beginning. You know, Africa is called the land of Ham there in the Bible. The Africans, the, the African race is, is from a Hamitic, a Hamitic people. It comes from Ham. There's, there's no doubt about that. All right? Even the Ethiopian term, Ethiopia, the etymology of that comes all the way back to Cush, if you follow that linguistically. Cush was one of the sons of Ham. All right, so it's interesting. You know what Ham hates and wants to rid himself of? He wants to rid himself of his servitude. Ham hates it. He despises that servitude. Why? He hates it so much that he harbors great bitterness over it, generally as a race, as a culture. Ham hates it so much that he wants to rewrite history so as to not remember that it ever happened. Ham hates that servitude, that curse placed on him so much that he wants to tear down any statues that even remotely remind him of it. Ham hates it so much that he wants everyone to pay him reparations for it. That's Ham. Now listen, he can get mad and tear down all the statues on earth, but it's not going to negate Genesis 9.25. You know what Ham wants? You know what Ham seeks after? Ham doesn't want to be on the bottom. Ham wants to be on the top. He's sick of the bottom. He wants the top. That's what Ham is after. Ham, yeah, exactly. Ham seeks after the opposite of servitude and poverty. And understandably so. Ham seeks after power and strength in the form of rule and dominion. He wants to be on top above Shem and above Japheth. So he can show them who's boss. And it makes perfect sense. That as a race, as a culture, that's what they would want. Ham naturally wants what he generally doesn't have. Rulership and dominion. And you can see that. That's not racist. That's just, that's just the fact of the matter. I mean, wouldn't you? <laughs> if, you're, if your culture, going all the way back to your founding fathers, was a servant of servants, wouldn't you be just sick of that? Sure. Understand. I understand. I, I read in my Bible where one time, a long time ago, one of Ham's great-grandsons rose to great power and was the ruler over the whole earth. And uh, his rulership was such a moral calamity and disaster for the earth that God himself had to come down and scatter the inhabitants of the earth. Nimrod was a son of Ham. That was the end of Nimrod's empire. And Ham has always wanted that back. Nimrod, the servant of servants, was on top. Literally, on top of the tower. <laughs> and Ham wants that back. Understandably. You know what's interesting? All three people groups are after... Uh, I'm just going to stick Egyptians in here, just for fun. Or Africans, but I'll put Egyptians, okay? Because we got Jews, Greeks, Egyptians. Uh, he wants dominion. Now, what's interesting is, in a way, all three of these groups are after power in one form or another. Japheth says, knowledge is power. <laughs> and he's after knowledge. Ham says, dominion, rule, is power. Shem says, no, magic is power. Power, power, power. Wonder-working power. That's what they want. <laughs> uh, remember how I said that Shem won't be won by powerful signs and Japheth won't be won by intellectually superior arguments? Well, Ham won't be won by appealing to his natural inclinations either. 
Ham will not be won by putting him on top and apologizing for your white privilege. Mm -hmm. Ham will not be won to Christ by getting on your knees and shining his shoes like the idiotic uh, CEO of Chick-fil-A did recently. Oh my God. That's not how you win Ham to Christ. You know, they're trying to say, well, Jesus washed the disciples' feet, and so we're going to shine the shoes of black people. And what? <laughs> You're not going to win them to Christ. You're appealing to his flesh. He loves that. Give me more. Not more of Jesus. More power over you. That's what he wants. Ham seeks after nobility. And not many noble are called. The ones chasing the nobility. Hamite. Not many noble are saved or called. He wants that. He wants the rule. And the more he seeks after it, the more he insists upon it, the farther he gets from God. Now, what if Ham did find God this way? You know what Ham would say? Ham would say, well, we found God. And if you want to find Him, you are going to have to become mighty and powerful like me. Through strength and power and force, you will finally meet with and stand with the mighty God, like me. <laughs> and that would put Ham in quite the position of arrogance, wouldn't it? God isn't going to be found at the end of Ham's Herculean rainbow. God says, okay, Ham, if you want to find me, you're going to have to become low. Mm. You're going to have to reject your might and your strength, and you're going to have to come to Calvary. You're going to have to, come, you're going to, have to go and look upon the King of Kings hanging upon a cross, who was abased, despised, spit upon, and whipped. And you know what? You're going to have to accept Him. And you're going to have to call upon Him. And you are going to have to identify with Him. You know what it takes for Ham to accept Christ? It takes humility and faith. <laughs> to Japheth's Sharin, God chooses the foolish, not the intellectually powerful. To Shem's Sharin, is that how you pronounce it? Sharin? Chagrin? Chagrin. Okay, I thought so. Chagrin, God chooses the weak, not the mystically powerful. And to Ham chagrin, God chooses the base, not the politically powerful, not the rulers, not the strong. God confounds the entire world at the cross. The entire world. All men must let go of their natural inclinations and humble themselves and come to Jesus Christ at the cross and place their simple faith in Him. Faith. It's not very intellectual. It's not very mystical. <laughs> it's not very regal. But it's divine. The cross is God's foolishness. The cross is God's weakness. The cross is God's baseness. But you know what's weird? Look at verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, all men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Any man, every man. Okay? And if I may, the baseness of God is higher than men. In other words, if Japheth will forsake his lust for wisdom and come to the cross, he will find God's wisdom, which is beyond any wisdom he could have ever known. In Christ, he will find the mind of Christ. He will find the mysteries of the universe contained in God's Word. In Christ, he'll find the wisdom. If Shem will forsake his lust for miraculous power and come to the cross... He will find God's miraculous power, which is beyond any power he could have ever known. In Christ, Shem will find the mysterious power of the resurrection. In Christ, Shem will find the mysterious power that comes with a walk with God. And he will discover the mysterious power of prayer in Christ. Ooh, mysterious. That's what Shem's after. It's all in Christ. If Ham will forsake his lust for dominion and come to the cross... He will find God's power and authority, which is beyond any power and authority he could have ever known. In Christ, Ham will find authority over sin. In Christ, Ham will find freedom and liberty from the, from the devil. And he, will, he can reign in life by one by Jesus Christ, according to Romans 5.17. In Christ. Everything mankind is seeking for, whether it be Shem, Ham, or Japheth, it's all found in Jesus Christ. But everything mankind is seeking for is hidden behind this thing. And because of that, a lot of people never see it. It's all behind there. That's where God hid it. That's where the treasure is 
X marks the spot. You have to accept the cross and all its foolishness and all its weakness and all its baseness in order to finally find what you've been looking for. Say, why is that? Verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Verse 30, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, if you're born again, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that, according as it is written, he that glorieth, whether it be Shem, Ham, or Japheth, let him glory in the Lord. Amen. Not in himself. Not in his own wisdom. Not in his own supernatural power. Not in his own dominion and strength. But him that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I come before you this morning, and I thank you, God, for your word. And God, I just thank you that, uh, Lord, you're, you're just an amazing God. Lord, this book is just, you didn't leave anybody out. Father, Lord, you leave no stone unturned. Father, you call out the failures and the problems of every single one of us. God, you're not, you don't favor necessarily one above another. You chose the Jew, but even they blew it miserably, Father. And so we thank you for Christ. We thank you, God, that in Christ everything is fixed. God, there's no uh, racism in Christ. There's no sexism in Christ. There's no class warfare in Christ. Lord, we're all just one in Christ, and we're thank so thankful for that. I'm glad, Lord, that I discovered what was behind that cross, and Lord, there's a bunch of people that uh, are going around and burning things and looting things and causing all kinds of havoc in this country right now that uh, if they're truly searching for something, they'd find it at Calvary. And I pray for those poor souls that, God, you'd help them to wake up from their delusion and the deception that's been uh, put upon them for the last three or four generations, God. I just pray that you'd wake them up. And I pray, Father, that, God, this uh, video would be a, a shining light and some truth to even some Christians, God, that are getting swept up in this garbage. Father, help us to come back to the book and just trust the truth that's in it. And, Father, we thank you for all you've done for us. We love you. We pray you bless the remainder of the day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. He gave me that one a while ago. I just haven't been able to put it together yet. Oh, yeah. I should probably turn that off. Yeah, thank you. So, Pastor Craig, are we all God's children? Uh, if we're saved, we are. People that aren't saved are technically children of the devil. Jesus said, you're of your father, the devil. So there's God's children and the devil's children, spiritually speaking. Um, yeah. Because people are, that's the big phrase now. Well, we're all done.